Hello everybody, welcome to the first episode of Mega Structures with me, Simon Whistler. This uh, might actually not be called Mega Structures. It's a working name. I'm actually recording this video before I've come up with a final name for the channel. If this channel is called Mega Structures, then I didn't come up with anything more creative anyway. In this premiere episode, we're covering the International Space Station, which, you know, is a bold place to start. So let's crack on. The space race, which began in the 1950s, pitted the two world superpowers against one another. Of course, that's the USSR and the United States. Pretty crazy to think that just a few decades ago, these guys were kind of on equal power footings. Anyway, the Soviet Union appeared to have the upper hand in the early exchanges, putting the first living being, a dog named Laika, and the first human, Yuri Gagarin, into space. Not at the same time the dog came first, although sometimes I feel if we were doing this in the West, the, uh, the, the humans would go first to make sure that it's safe for dogs because Apparently, everyone values dog lives above humans. Who knew? But this only spurred on the United States with John F. Kennedy famously proclaiming, We choose to go to the moon. I'm not going to try and do a JFK voice. And seven years later, that was exactly what happened. On July the 16th, 1969, Neil Armstrong took his one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And interestingly there, with the one small step for man, it should definitely be one small step for a man. Otherwise, it makes no sense. On the recording, he definitely doesn't say the A, even though he kept maintaining that he absolutely did. I think I did a whole video about that on my Today I Found Out channel. I might link to it below. Despite the nuclear arms race taking place on Earth, the 1970s saw a mellowing relationship between the US and the Soviet Union as far as space was concerned, which culminated in the first joint expedition in 1975, something that would have been unheard of just 10 years before. The Apollo-Soyuz test project was seen as a detente, the easing of a strained relationship. It was not only regarded as a success, but paved the way for a much larger and more ambitious project which was to come. Yeah, when you think about this in like the overall historic perspective, it's pretty insane that there was the Cold War where we almost destroyed every living being, and then a few years later we're working together pretty much the whole world, but primarily the United States and the USSR, to uh, build a space station. The concept of a space station was not a new one. In fact, the groundwork for these ideas, in the United States at least, began in the 1950s. Kraft Eric, assistant to the technical director of San Diego-based Convair, was the first person to begin any serious planning on the subject. Eric had worked for Nazi Germany on the V-2 rockets, which terrorized southern England during the final period of World War I, but now he turned his attention to the Atlas Booster, America's first intercontinental ballistic missile, which would be used to carry the early Mercury spacecrafts into orbit. And there's a whole extra story there about all the ex-Nazis who went to work for America because they had skills. Then it was okay. His idea of using empty propellant tanks as habitable quarters was groundbreaking, and just six months after the Soviet Sputnik satellite successfully blasted into orbit, his proposals were made public to Congress. I've never heard of this, so I'm assuming it never happens. However, plans were shelved after the Soviets launched the first man into space, as it was decided that NASA should concentrate on matching their achievements. It would be pretty epic if there were just a whole bunch of people living in space in, like, empty fuel canisters. <laughs> the first space station of sorts was in 1969, when two Russian Soyuz vehicles were linked in space for the first time. It's a pretty rudimentary space station. In terms of inhabited orbiting station, the Soviet Union and later Russia remained well ahead. The Mir space station, constructed in space between 1986 and 1996, became the world's first continuously inhabited structure, orbiting the Earth until its re-entry in 2001. <laughs> re-entry makes it seem like, yeah, it came and it landed on Earth and now it's in a museum. No, it kind of like burned up in the atmosphere and then definitely landed in the Pacific, right? This is one of my early memories of being a kid, seeing the Mir space station go through the atmosphere on the news. Anyway, back in the United States, 1984 saw the re-emergence of plans which had received little attention for the best part of 20 years. The Space Station Freedom Project was announced by Ronald Reagan during his 1984 State of the Union address, but with Congress tiring of the enormous costs associated with it, it never got past the planning stage. Yeah, so I imagine we're gonna get into the costs of making space stations later in the video, but it is absolutely wild. In 1993, a meeting between NASA and the Russian Space Agency agreed on a monumental step forward. The International Space Station, in theory at least, was born. It'd be a bit weird if it was in practice. Yeah, they went to a meeting and then the space station was just done. The construction of the space station took 10 years and 30 separate missions to complete. It involved the 
collaboration of 15 different countries across five different space agencies, and quite simply, nothing like it had ever been undertaken before. When we see pictures of the International Space Station, or ISS as it is often referred to, it can be difficult to gauge the size of the thing. But the numbers associated with this behemoth are really impressive. At 73 meters in length and 109 meters wide, it is approaching the size of a small football pitch. Wait, what's a small football pitch? A football pitch is not normal sizes? And this is all in metric. I apologize, Americans. This is terrible. So it's just smaller than a soccer pitch, about 100 yards by 130 yards. So don't forget, the International Space Station is absolutely massive for, you know, something that is in space. We see these images of people inside because there's like lots of little tunnel things and it's not, you know, particularly spacious, but there are a lot of them. Unsurprisingly, it's also carrying quite a bit of weight, 460 tons to be exact, but of course it still manages to float effortlessly in in zero gravity. Although, yeah, it's really heavy, but also remember that has got to get up to space, and the cost of sending weight to space is insane. The construction of the ISS began in November 1998, when the first module, Zaya, was launched on the back of a Russian Proton rocket. Two weeks later, it was joined by the American module Unity, which was affixed to the waiting Zaya. The successful fusing of these two sections created the first station in space under international cooperation. But as of yet, it could not sustain human life. To describe the construction as painstaking would be a bit of an understatement here. The challenges associated with such an ambitious project had simply never been attempted before. Each future module would need to be transported from Earth, then manually attached in space. The ISS needed to become inhabitable as quickly as possible. On July the 12th, 2000, the fledgling station was joined by a third module, the Zvezdia, which provided the life support systems for the first time. And apparently the Russians got to name all of these early ones because they are difficult to pronounce. In November 2000, the first astronauts arrived at the space station. Expedition 1 consisted of an American, Bill Shepard, and two Russian cosmonauts, Yuri Gizenko and Sergei K. Oh my god. <laughs> Krikalev. Krikalev. They blasted off from Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. If you'd like to learn more about Baikonur Cosmodrome, by the way, I've got another channel called Geographics where I talk all about that. It is a crazy story. It's in the middle of nowhere. Perhaps symbolically, Gagarin's start was chosen as their launch pad from which Yuri Gagarin had departed and became the first person in space in 1961, as we just talked about a minute ago. After 33 orbits of the Earth, Expedition 1 successfully docked with the ISS on the 2nd of November 2000. 90 minutes later, Bill Shepard opened the hatch and became the first person to set foot, metaphorically speaking, of course, on the International Space Station. This began the continuous habitation of the ISS that has continued to this day. And people spent, I think people spent like six months on this thing. Over the next two years, the station expanded steadily with the Piers Docking Department, Destiny Laboratory, and Quest Airlock all being added, while the Canada Arm 2 became the station's main robotic arm. It appeared the station would continue to expand quickly, but in 2003, tragedy struck. On February the 1st, NASA's mission control at Houston lost contact with the Space Shuttle Columbia as it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. And we all know what happened with this story. The shuttle, which had spent 16 days in space, had suffered critical damage on takeoff, leading to the heat shield being compromised. As we all know, the shuttle broke up and everybody died. This was the second fatal accident involving the space program after the loss in 1986 of Space Shuttle Challenger. As a result, US spaceflight operations were suspended for over two years while investigations took place. The brisk construction of the ISS ground to a halt, while the Russian Roscosmos State Space Corporation provided the only resupply flights to and from the station. I believe that's what's happening now, right? Until Elon Musk gets people going to space. It's all done from that Baikonur Cosmodrome that we already mentioned in Russia. It's sort of relying on the Russians to get everyone into space. Assembly resumed in 2006, and over the next five years, a steady stream of modules and components were added to form what is today the recognizable station. There are currently 15 modules with a further five awaiting delivery. And this is the really crazy thing about the ISS. It's just grown over time, like extra bits just get plugged on, kind of like building a house in The Sims, I guess. 2007 was notable because it brought the first non-American or Russian involvement with the ISS. The European Space Agency, the ESA, launched its Harmony module on October the 23rd as part of a larger mission from the Kennedy Space Station in Florida. It now serves a wide range of functions 
options from providing sleeping accommodation to power supplies and electronic data. Originally named Node 2, it became part of a nationwide competition in the US, where 2,200 students from kindergarten to high school across 32 states were asked to build a model of the space station and write an essay proposing a new name and explanation. The winning entry came from the Brown Academy in Virginia, and the name Harmony has been used ever since. Over time, the ESA has launched a further two modules, with Columbus becoming a part of the ISS in 2008 and Tranquility launching in 2010. The interesting thing about the European Space Agency and like its relationship with the UK is like, like any kid, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was, you know, five. And then my parents were never like, oh, well, that's not going to happen because we don't have a space program. I mean, they should just break our dreams now. We should have a space program. I know it's insanely expensive, but it would be cool for kids to actually have a shot at being astronauts. Columbus now is one of the largest ESA modules, but was first planned to actually be part of an autonomous space station solely controlled by the ESA, an idea which never got off the ground. The Japanese experimental module named Kibo, meaning hope, was launched over three separate flights and currently forms the largest single module of the ISS. This is predominantly a scientific module and has been carrying out experiments ever since. It's always boring. It's like, well, what's this module do? Science. What does this one do? Electronics. What does this one do? Sleeping. What's this one do? Well, that's the Irish module. It's a bar. Understandably, considering where it is, the costs involved with the construction have been enormous, and it has been dubbed the most expensive single item ever constructed. Although, is that really fair? It's made up of a ton of different parts. That'd be like saying, oh, that city's the most expensive city ever constructed. But it's a city. You know, it's many things put together. As of 2010, the cost has totaled $150 billion, although that is an insane amount of money. The 36 shuttle flights needed to build and transport goods has cost over $50 billion. That's $1.4 billion per flight, which is going to be the most expensive delivery service in the world. As I mentioned earlier, the space station has been inhabited continuously since the year 2000. The number of long-term ISS crew have lived on board stands at 109, while others categorized as visitors, number 228. I feel like if you're sending someone to space, shouldn't they stay there for a while? Because just getting them there is insanely expensive. The allocation of places among countries involved is dependent on how much each contributes to the overall budget. I get the feeling that's why only one Brit's ever been up there. <laughs> The US, as the largest financial contributor, has sent 145 people to the ISS, while Russia has sent 46. In general, the ISS supports a crew of between 3 and 6, but has been as high as 13, but only for short changeover periods. But you'd think, you know, it's fairly big. Don't they have space for more people? Because I've seen those videos where they're all floating around on there, and there does seem to be a lot of space. But I guess this, it's... <laughs> Obviously more complicated than that, Simon. With the retirement of the space shuttle fleet in 2011, it left only the smaller Russian Soyuz spacecraft as forms of human transportation to and from the ISS. These ships can carry three passengers at a time, and typically teams like this are rotated every six months. Two Soyuzes are also permanently kept on hand at the space station should the crew need to return in an emergency. That's got to be exceptionally cool, evacuating an international space station and splashing down on Earth. I mean, I'm sure it's terrible why you had to evacuate, but still, it's very James Bond. Between 2015 and 2016, an experiment in space endurance took place. American Scott Kelly and Russian Mikhail Kornienko maybe spent a total of 340 days aboard before landing safely in Kazakhstan on March 2, 2016. The purpose of their extended stay was to examine how the human body would cope physically and mentally with extended time in space, and indeed for long-distance space travel. Desire, I've also made a video on this in the past where NASA paid people I think it was $16,000 to lie in bed for three months to simulate what it would be like to spend so much time in space. And I don't know why they did. These dudes just spent like a year in space. Yet while 340 day almost a year. Yet while 340 days broke the record on the ISS, Russian cosmonaut Valery Polyakov spent a whopping 437 days and 18 hours on the Russian Mir station between 1994 and 1995? That's an insane amount of time. You gotta go slightly crazy, right? I mean, Mir was quite small. Moving on. So what is the purpose of the space station? Well, we're really late in the video to be getting to this. <laughs> While the crew on board spend most of their time performing experiments and carrying out routine maintenance. Many experiments involve everyday things that we have on Earth to assess their potential use and hazards in space. 3D printers, espresso machines, and fire extinguishers are just some of the trials that have been undertaken on board. It's like, okay, I get 3D printers because we need to build like space colonies and of course like fire extinguishers because we need to put out fires. But it's like number one priority. Does the coffee work? 
Cheers. I put this down because it was hard to hold while talking. <laughs> In 2015, those part of Expedition 44 were able to sample the first vegetables grown in space, red romaine lettuce. In case you were wondering, I wasn't, but what a thrill. <laughs> At least two hours every day is dedicated to exercise or personal care. This may sound like quite a bit when you compare to what people do back on Earth, but one significant drawback of space travel that we're only really beginning to address is how bone density shrinks. In fact, an astronaut can lose between 1 and 2% of their bone mass every month, so regular and specific exercise not only keeps them healthy, but quite literally maintains their bodies. I mean, you guys have probably seen those uh, videos or images where the astronauts get back from space and they're like need help walking because well like on earth your body's really heavy <laughs> and it's not just the bones that suffer problems with the cardiovascular system and eyes are commonplace complaints with many astronauts reporting permanent changes to their vision after returning to earth i didn't even know that of course they are also attached securely but many who have done it describe it as an unrivaled experience yeah even if you're attached i've seen enough movies to be afraid that that's gonna break and then there's just the vast void which i mean if you kick off there's nothing stopping you. You will just drift forever. I mean, your oxygen will run out and you'll die. But you're just going to drift forever until you, like, fall into the sun or something, right? Most spacewalks are for routine maintenance, and you would be surprised how much time is spent cleaning the windows outside, which certainly puts some perspective on washing the car every Sunday morning. Sure does. Thankfully, the ISS has so far been free of any serious issues while astronauts are out on spacewalks. With one notable exception, on July the 16th, 2013, Italian astronaut Luca Parmitano was taking part in a spacewalk when his helmet began filling with liquid. It's difficult to imagine how harrowing this must have been. Yeah, you imagine his death suit drowned in space. So like there's a really limited amount of water up there. It was later found that a spacewalk done a week earlier had experienced a water leakage also, but had, it had wrongly been attributed to a faulty drink bag. The incident was enough for NASA to classify it as a high-risk close call. Half an hour into a six-and-a-half-hour spacewalk, Parmiento reported back to Mission Control that he could feel water on his neck. Shortly after the decision was taken to cancel the spacewalk, and Parmitano began making his way back to safety, while a slow but steady stream of water was entering and slowly filling his helmet. It's like a horror movie. He later said that the water was entering his eyes and nose, making it difficult to breathe. Others commended him on his astonishing calmness in the face of such a potential catastrophe. Once safely back inside, roughly one and a half liters of water came gushing out. It was a reminder of the potential dangers involved in these kinds of activities. I don't feel we need any reminder about how dangerous it is to walk outside in space with just like a thin layer protecting you from the endless void of nothingness. <laughs> More recently, there has been a more mysterious but potentially even more damaging incident. As the astronauts lay asleep on the night of August 30, 2018, a warning signal alerted NASA that the air pressure on the ISS had fallen slightly, suggesting a small leak somewhere on the station. <laughs> oh my god. It's gonna be like, it is out of a horror movie, right? Since it was relatively minor, the decision was taken not to wake the astronauts, but in the morning they were instructed to scour the whole station. It was not long until a tiny hole was discovered in one of the Soyuz spacecraft. While oxygen levels were boosted, they covered the hole with tape. <laughs> then they sealed it permanently with sealant and gauze. Sounds like a better idea. Don't they have welders up there, though? <laughs> the pressure on the RSS stabilized and the hole was initiated. That was a joke. I know that welding would probably, like, ignite that oxygen environment, right? The pressure on the RSS stabilized and the hole was initially blamed on micrometeoroids, small rocks which on occasion have struck the station and other spacecrafts. But like any good mystery, things were about to take an unexpected turn. After NASA published a photo on Twitter, numerous users began questioning the meteor theory, and the post was quickly deleted. And you feel like that's <laughs> you feel like that sort of action is only gonna like fan the flames of a conspiracy theory. <laughs> it's like, well we said we really don't think it's a meteorite. Someone, you know, it's sabotage, and then NASA deletes it, you're like, oh it's sabotage. Shortly after Russians investigated the hole announced that they believed it had been man-made, possibly with a drill, and had most likely come from inside the Soyuz rather than outside. That's dark. They were not able to determine whether it had been made before or after the spacecraft had left Earth, and to this day, it remains an unexplained mystery. That is kind of terrifying. Anyway, the continuation and indeed the existence of the ISS has been brought into question in recent years. In 2014, the US placed sanctions on Russia in response to its annexation of Crimea. Russian Deputy Prime Minister Dmitry Rogozin responded by saying that the Roscosmos State Space Corporation would reject requests by the US to prolong the use of the station past 2020. Nine months later, it would seem that everything had changed, with Roscosmos announcing that they would be a part of the ISS program until at least 2024. 
before. What I, one thing I do like about the ISS is that often, you know, space travel and stuff does sit slightly outside of politics and the scientists just get on and do their things, but obviously not all the time. And then of course there was the Cold War, which was basically, you know, people landed on the moon because of politics. With the short-term future of the space station resolved, the next few years are likely to see significant changes. Space tourism is now on the horizon, and just last January, NASA announced it had chosen a company to build a private hotel on board the ISS that could be launched as early as 2024. I had no idea about that. That is epic. There was this guy who spent like his whole life building a company and then his company reached this valuation he sold it all and spent like the 11 million dollars or whatever it was to go uh, on a private holiday you know trip space tourism trip to the iss for like 11 days this is right off the top of my head. It's an incredible story. If I can find an article on this, I'll link it below. It is entirely possible that within the next 10 years, the International Space Station could be transformed from primarily a research facility to one of the most exclusive holiday destinations. I'm pretty skeptical on that. By 2024, within the next 10 years, I don't think that's going to happen. With private... <laughs> Maybe in 10 years, people will be watching this video from space and be like, well, he was wrong, wasn't he? What a knob. Either way, it does seem like the International Space Station is going to be around for a while. This has been working title Mega Structures. I've been Simon. If you like this video, smash that like button. If you didn't, well, you can smash the dislike button, but you watched it all. So did you really not like it? Think about it. Think about your choices. Smash that like button. Subscribe to this channel. It's new. This is possibly the first episode. And I'll see you next time.